Up next, we have kind of one of our final presentations of the day. Um, essentially, we have the Vice President of Technology and Innovation at Trimble. Uh, Aviad al Magor specializes in deeply frustrating uh, and, and kind of uh, technical technologies which provide quite a fruitful result if we can execute on them. So his job is not something that many people would be able to do because you've got to be thick skinned and have a pretty big heart to see the generosity of humans when you're trying to force them to go a different way. Um, you know, he's very, very highly educated. He has a master's degree from Cambridge, an MBA from Harriet Watt University, and a Bachelor of Architecture as well from the Israeli Institute of Technology. So I don't want to pump him up too much, but he might be the smartest man in this room right now. So put your hands together, give him a big Canadian warm welcome, Aviad al -Magor. Hello, everyone. It's uh, actually a great event so far. I even got uh, a nice shirt. Test it. Beautiful. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to be the last presenter, and, and Gary promised me I can talk as much as I want. So just a warning. But I know I'm, I'm between you and dinner, so I'll, I'll try to keep it a 15-minute short presentation. In fact, uh, future of innovation, talking about the future of innovation after a full day of presentation on the topic, excellent presentations from startups and the general contractors and investors. Um, there's not much to say anymore, so uh, you know, we can certainly uh, do it short. Um, so it, it, it will be some sort of summary and a wrap up and maybe some thoughts about next steps. Um, and obviously technology is core uh, to the future of the industry. But uh, before we, we dive into the topic, um, we should keep in mind what is the core motivation, what are the, the values, uh, what is driving us here. And it, it's a real pain of the industry, it's a real pain of users and, and customers. Uh, it's a real challenge that we have, that we experience as a society. Really demanding challenges as we never faced before. And I'm talking about mainly about three main challenges that you see here. The um, pressure on the environment, the need to reduce our carbon footprint, the growing population, the need for us as an industry to provide the, 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 the supportive infrastructure and, and housing, and as we heard earlier today, the um, uh, skilled labor shortage. So really a, a challenge at this scale, and, and it's actually a set of challenges, require an industry level approach and, and, and industry level wide effort. It's not a one company uh, solution. It's not that Trimble will come and save this industry or Autodesk or Proco or any other startup. It's really about a, a collaborative effort together with you, together with the GC, together with the whole community to, to, to make a change. In a way, it's about a collective set of ideas that you already presented and, and experienced today. So what we should do, we should look at it as, as a one holistic continuum from the design to build to operate. We should really take a look at this as, as one continuum where we are looking for efficiency. We are looking for ways to really bring this industry to the next level. We should look at it from an interoperability point of view, but not from this uh, narrow uh, prism of software interoperability. We are doing this already, but from an industry-wide interoperability. The societal, societal, the political, the business aspect, we should make sure that everything is really uh, supporting a workflow. We should get rid of the siloed structures that we still have in the industry as much as we try to, to remove it because this is part of the inefficiencies that we experience as an industry. Now, we have uh, a tough starting point, and some of you might be familiar with this image. It is from uh, a research work done by Box.com in 2014, and still highly relevant for us today. This image reflects the uh, structures, organizational structures of, of uh, companies inside specific sectors. So if you look at the uh, bottom right, financial industry, not surprisingly, very, very centralized structure, very efficient. On top, you see the manufacturing industry with slightly more uh, freedom. And then we see this beautiful but somewhat chaotic structure of the construction 
company. And if you think about it, it's, it's the nature of the industry because if this reflects a construction company, what we see here is actually those clusters are project. A GC might work all around the country or around the globe. So those clusters represent the project. There's no real center. And for each cluster, we have local teams working for this project. It can be designers, engineers, regulation, local authorities, the public, and those are the, the, the purple dot that you see around the clusters. So that structure can potentially, we, we cannot change it. It's part of the nature of the industry. But what we can do, we can utilize technology in order to get the same efficiency as we see in finance, but while keeping this kind of chaotic but beautiful structure that we see on the screen. And when I'm talking about technology, I would like to start with digital transformation. And I know most of you, many of the GCs in the room are in the process of digital transformation. And this is a critical process for, for us because it will provide stakeholders and decision makers with data. Data to make decisions. It will ensure an automate process or enable automate processes and makes data-driven decisions for everyone. So the digital transformation is sitting and it's kind of the, the, the foundation of the changes that we are looking for in the industry. Now this is a long journey and the gray hair tribe here in the room might say, yes, we tried this in the past. Why should it work now? What change? And we believe that there is a change in the environment now because we have several enabling factors which can make this transition a successful transition now. And I'm talking about mainly about three major enablers. The first one is computing power. We have today enough power on the edge and in the cloud to process the amount of data that we get from the field, to get the right insight, to provide predictive and prescriptive outcomes for our decision makers. The second one might have a Connectivity issue here? You all familiar with the sound, correct? 56K modem. Oh, it's a beautiful sound. It's kind of the entering the world wide web. I, I remember the excitement seeing the site kind of revealing itself while this sound was in the background. We don't need this anymore, of course. We are always connected and the bandwidth grows significantly every year. We have enough connectivity, enough bandwidth now to connect the office to the field, the field to the office, machine to machine, digital to physical, enough bandwidth to really get real-time decisions. And then the third enabler is data, and we have a lot of it as an industry. And, and Jeff mentioned here earlier today, it's not necessarily just about the data, it's about the right data. Collectively, we have the right data and we need to be able to share it with each other anonymously to actually send it back to, the, to all who, who share data in order to get meaningful uh, insights. It's not enough, whatever the size of a GC is, it's not enough to collect the data that you have to gain real, meaningful, trustful insight. You need the collective amount of data from the industry to really be able uh, to start using automated processes, start deploying AI in order to get those meaningful insights. So with these enablers, with these three enablers, we can benefit from the convergence of advanced and early phase technologies such as AI, robotics, computer vision, and later on quantum as well. And let's take a look at a few examples. And I would like to start with solving the boring stuff, what you see on the top right there. It's about using AI to process invoices. Who wants to process invoices? Raise your hand. No one. With AI, and this is already in, the, in use, we can process thousands, hundreds of thousands of invoices in a friction of time compared to a human performing this job in a better quality and again, removing this burden from, from the human workforce. So once we are uh, solving this kind of uh, uh, boring stuff, we can start saving life, what you see on the uh, bottom left, using machine learning and AI technology, 
in order to monitor fatigue of machine operator. Again, a technology which is already in use, saving lives. And then the next steps, look at the uh, uh, top left, uh, collecting data from the field in an autonomous way for production control and quality control. Imagine this type of robot waking up at 5 a.m. in the morning, going to a tour on site, measuring the progress, checking for quality, and at 7 a.m. when his uh, human teammates arrive, the dog is already in his doghouse, connected to the edge compute, process the data, upload the data to the cloud so it will be available to the decision makers to understand the status of their project. And finally, autonomous machines. What you see is this autonomous compactor already announced, already available, and we have several uh, companies delivering similar solutions already. This is about addressing the labor shortage. This is about reducing carbon footprint by optimizing processes. It's about improving the quality and the productivity of the team on site. Now, what you see here on the screen is not one single technology. It's not AI. It's not robotics. It's the convergence of a set of technologies which are utilizing the enablers we set, we discussed earlier. So it's really bringing together computer vision and IoT sensors and robotics and AI um, and edge compute and cloud compute together to deliver the outcomes that we see on the screen. And we can actually go on and on. We, we just don't have time for this, but um, just two additional examples, what you see on the, on the top right, it's about using machine learning for classification of object in point cloud, creating semantic models in order to improve the prediction and the monitoring of critical assets. And on the bottom left, you see Autonomy level four, how you can send a robot to an environment, a collaboration with a startup called Exene Technologies, how you can really send a robot to an unknown environment and you want him to come back no matter what the environment is, covering uh, the full environment with uh, reality capture. Now this is critical for us because what is a construction site? It's an unknown environment. Every day it looks different. So we need this capability in order to get the efficiency of uh, robotics. Now, I'm presenting this slide uh, to kind of address a question about how we move forward, how we envision the future. And what you see here is a, in this video that I will run in a second is not a real product. It's part of a vision that was set by our uh, heavy civil team. Three years ago, we started a new initiative at Trimble called Dreamer Hack. It's not a standard hackathon. You're not doing any coding. You're not uh, trying to develop a feature to an existing product. You are Im imagining the future of the industry. So you dream big. You try to figure out what will happen next. And the idea here is to really release the, the uh, not just the engineers, the, the product team, the marketer, the sales guys from the day-to-day -day activity and enable them uh, with some tools to really think about the future and how the industry will look like in order for us later on to do reverse engineering to some of those ideas and make sure that we are ready for this future. So what you see here in this case is again about convergence. We see a, a, a digital twin of a construction site and this digital twin is presented in this case in a table at the office using mixed reality devices. The uh, autonomous machine in the field can be seen in real time and the user can dive into a specific machine and see all the telematics and understand even from a first person point of view what's going on on site. So improving the monitoring, improving the understanding of what's going on in the field and optimize processes. So that's kind of a part of the vision of this specific team which really enable us to think back and say, okay, if this is going to happen soon, what we should do in order to support this type of future. Now, talking about roadmap, and uh, again, this is about the future of construction, but we are in a time where, you know, Horizon 1, Horizon 2, Horizon 3 is not anymore about time. It's about level of disruption. Horizon 3 can be here tomorrow. Think about ChatGPT, five days, one million users. Five days from the point they announced to the point they got one million users. So the pace of the development, the pace of disruption is huge, and it's quite tough to create a roadmap. We need to do strategy, but we need to make sure it's, it's, it's kind of flexible. So I try to 
create some roadmap, and I decided to use um, uh, MidJourney, actually a tool that um, was mentioned earlier. Actually, all the images in the presentation are from MidJourney. Um, and I tried to test the reliability, so I say, okay, let's check my own roadmap. And I ask MidJourney to really figure out what will, what will happen in 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, and so on. And as you can see, the, um, it's, it's probably the reality, but it's not so pleasant future. And don't laugh because we can do the same exercise on, on, on your picture. But, um, you know, we can take these same tools, same AI solution, and try to predict the future of the construction industry. I don't want to do it because I don't want to uh, depress you. And I promised Gary that we'll end up here with a very optimistic message. So what we can do, how we can deal with this kind of very dynamic environment with all the changes that are happening all the time. You know, we have the tendency when we plan to set a goal in the future and look for this point and start moving toward this point. That's our nature. But what we should keep in mind that second after we set this point, there is a cone of possible futures that we should consider. And a day later, there is a bigger cone of probable futures, which we again, we should consider. So we should really keep our agility, we should keep open mind because the only constant we have in our common journey here is change. And since we're in Canada, I would like to leave you with a, a message, personal message from your prime minister about the future. Thank you very much. <laughs>